technological issues. You'd think I'd get good at these by now. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, Two weeks ago, we did the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor class, so our, our kind of backbone of HIV therapy. Today, I'm going to go over the protease inhibitor class um, and talk through those meds. And a lot of the protease inhibitor class um, is no longer utilized um, just because of history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'll talk through that. So we'll actually talk about drug interactions with um, this class as well, because there's a lot of drug interactions. So I feel like this is a good place to, to talk about drug interactions. So relevant disclosures, um, I did serve on the advisory board of Thera Technologies, should not impact anything that I say today. Uh, learning objectives, we're gonna go over the protease and ever class. We're gonna talk about mechanism of action and the pharmacokinetic enhancer, which is our big um, drug interaction problem. We're gonna go over the drug interactions and then I'll give um, different resources for drug interactions. I know everybody kind of has their favorites, um, but with HIV medications, sometimes it gets um, a little more specific. So I'll go through some that I use specifically for HIV. Um, so this graph is, um, I think hands down, one of the coolest graphs in HIV history and potentially in all of modern medical history. I'm a little biased because I love HIV, but um, I think it really shows the impact of good antiretroviral therapy. So prior to the protease inhibitors being utilized in um, about 1995, 1996, um, we didn't really, ha we didn't have highly active antiretroviral therapy or heart. So prior to that, um, we were using mono or dual nucleosides together and um, it wasn't working as you can see um, with the death rate here, right? So in, you know, the early nineties, the death rate from HIV AIDS was um, phenomenal. In fact, um, by the mid nineties, um, it was the number one cause of death of all Americans um, within that youngest age bracket of young adults of the CDC um, groups. And I, I think that's like 18 to 24. So, you know, this was, this was a major epidemic um, or honestly pandemic um, at the time. So um, you're seeing these numbers of deaths. So again, we're using, you know, those nucleosides that we talked about two weeks ago, monotherapy, dual therapy, it wasn't working, people were still dying. Um, and actually, if you see a lot of those patients that survived that area, era, they'll have a lot of resistance to those nucleosides. Um, so I, there will be a lecture eventually about resistance, um, but you have to think about some of those older guys have resistance, not because they were necessarily non-compliant, they were super compliant, they were just super compliant to the wrong thing, um, because the medical world didn't in um, 1995, the first protease inhibitor was developed, and as we started pairing two nukes plus our protease inhibitor, um, the use of PIs um, increases through the late 90s, and we actually see for the first time in HIV history um, the rate of deaths decline. Um, I'm using my hands to talk because, of course, I'm in front of an audience, and you guys can all follow where my slides are on my computer. Um, so sorry about that. I realize I'm seeing myself with the camera going, I'm using my hands and you guys don't care. Um, so I think this is just one of the coolest graphs of talking about the power of highly active antiretroviral therapy. So one of the questions that I always ask my pharmacy students when I have them is, um, in what world do we ever use two drug classes, two drugs of the same drug class, right? Uh, never. You're, you're not going to use two beta blockers together. You're not going to use two beta lactams except in some really rare, weird situation. Um, we're just not going to do it. But here we get heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy, by combining two of those nukes and a protease inhibitor. And so that's where we get our two, two nukes plus a third agent from is way back in the 90s. Why do we do that? It's it's what worked then. And we've just kind of followed that pattern. And so as we talk about two drug therapy, you know, um, regimens like Dovato and Jaluka, they're kind of pushing against that historical backdrop that we've always done, but that's kind of why we do what we do. So there is our introduction of heart. So getting into the actual protease inhibitor mechanism of action, it's here at the very end of the life cycle um, of um, viral entry into the CD4 count. It gets integrated into human DNA, and then it actually buds off and protease um, is active in that budding process um, for the mature viron to, to come out. And so protease inhibitors stop that particular part of the sequence. 
Um, so this is a list of all of the old protease inhibitors. So depending on which chart you have, if you um, have charts from different pharma companies, I think the one from Positively Aware that Walgreens puts out has um, historical medications at the very bottom of it. Um, and so this is where you've got to find all of those medications. They probably won't be listed under the protease inhibitors. They're going to be historical. Um, and so um, lopinavir got on here twice, but, you know, indenivir, fosamprenivir, sequinivir, and nilotinivir, and lopinavir are all older protease inhibitors that we're not really using anymore. Um, some of these can be used without a pharmacokinetic agent, and we'll talk about that pharmacokinetic agent in a minute, um, but just know that the modern protease inhibitors that you're going to be using require a pharmacokinetic inhibitor, um, and really these should not really be used. Um, I think we have one patient maybe left on Lexiva, um, and I think I have one patient left on Kaletra um, in our patient population of 1300. So um, I've been trying to actively get those patients off of the protease inhibitors just because these older protease inhibitors have a lot more metabolic syndrome issues, um, a lot more, um, you know, A1C increases, lipid problems, and you just have some more problems with them. And as you get into the modern protease inhibitors, those things are still there, but they're significantly less. Um, so protease inhibitors. Um, are no longer considered our first line therapy in the guidelines. They're all preferred under clinical situations. Um, so for a while, this was called the alternative category. Um, they've changed it to preferred in clinical, certain clinical situations. Um, so integrase inhibitors are the kind of the mover and shaker of the HIV world now. But protease inhibitors still have their place. Um, in, again, in certain clinical situations. And when I think about um, certain clinical situations and the guidelines back this up is really it's those patients that I want a high barrier to resistant drug on. Um, so somebody that comes in and they're actively using meth and they've no showed the first couple of appointments to the clinic and I don't really know where they're getting their next meal and I'm like really worried about all of those things, that may be somebody I give a protease inhibitor to because I know that their barrier to resistance is a lot higher than some of the other other drugs, especially my nucleosides and my non-nucleosides and my first generation um, integrase inhibitors. Um, so the two that are going to be preferred are going to be darunavir um, or adizanavir. Both can be boosted with either ritonavir or cobacistat, which is the pharmacokinetic enhancer that we'll talk more about de in detail later. Um, as their individual agents, darunavir is Prezista brand name and adizanavir is Rayataz brand name. If they are boosted in their combination with Cobacistat, it's Prescobix or Evotaz, respectively, as you can see there on the slide. Um, does need to be combined with other agents. Remember, this is going to be most likely the two nucleus, two of the nucleosides that we talked about last time. Um, just some notes off the guideline: Anazanavir is not actually recommended in combination with a Bacavir and Lamivudine in an initial patient because you'll have um, higher rates of virologic failure. Um, and in general, Darunavir has the um, higher um, recommendation in the guidelines over adizanavir. Um, and that has a lot to do with darunavir's tolerability. Um, adizanavir has some drug interactions that we'll talk about here in a little bit that are um, more problematic than darunavir. And so um, darunavir has a higher level of recommendation. So um, protease inhibitors rules of thumb. So this is again, when I have pharmacy students, if I want them to think of, you know, if you hear protease inhibitor, this is what I want you to think of. Um, these are kind of where I'm at. Um, boosting is required, especially with the modern protease inhibitors. Um, so you're going to get drug interactions because if you're boosting that protease inhibitor, you're boosting, boosting anything else that goes through that same pathway. Um, protease inhibitors require to be taken with food. Um, so patient doesn't have to be a meal, doesn't have to be, you know, this five course dinner, um, does need to be something, you know, a piece of toast, an apple, something to, to get all of the stomach enzymes going. Um, worst side effects are going to be metabolic adverse effects. So we need to be monitoring A1C, we need to be monitoring lipids, we need to be monitoring um, just all those metabolic parameters of our patients. And then GI side effects are especially very common. Again, less so with our modern ones, um, but they are still there. Usually what I'll tell patients is um, take the medication for at least the first four to six weeks. You may experience some stomach upset, but a lot of times it'll go away. Take it with food, it'll get better. Um, I will say that I um, rarely have a problem if somebody's experiencing a lot of GI effect of their protease inhibitor, especially early on in therapy in those first six weeks, to give them something for nausea. So give them Zofran, give them Phenergan, um, have them take it 15 minutes before they take their HIV meds. Um, and see if that helps while they get through those first initial weeks of being on the medication. 
Um, so talking about boosting, I've, I've, re I've referenced it several times already. So hepatic metabolism and pharmacokinetic boosting. So um, both um, ritonavir and cobacistat um, are involved here. So CYP-P450 and P-glycoprotein are the main points responsible um, in the metabolism of protease inhibitor and also the integrase inhibitor L-vitegravir. So when we talk about integrase inhibitors, L-vitegravir is also um, in this conversation. The result is poor bioavailability. So if you look at that graph on the right, um, you can see this graph is off of lapinavir alone, but it can be, um, you get the same kind of effect with any of them. Lapinavir alone um, just falls off less than 12 hours. So that means you would have to dose lapinavir honestly probably three to four times a day to get a good area under the curve. But when you add ritonavir on for that pharmacokinetic enhancing, you see a much nicer area under the curve. Um, it's a lot smoother and so it can facilitate um, taking lopinavir um, once or twice daily depending on how you're dosing it. Um, and so these pharmacokinetic boosters, either ritonavir or cobacistat, they decrease the hepatic metabolism of your protease inhibitors, giving you a better C-max, a C-min, and an area under the curve. But again, remember that if you're boosting um, and you're inhibiting the metabolism of your protease inhibitor, you're also inhibiting everything else that goes through P450 and, or CYP450 and P-glycoprotein, which um, is a lot of things, which is what this slide talks about. No, nope, my next slide. Please hold. Got ahead of myself. Um, so uh, there are a little bit difference between ritonavir and cobacistat. Um, cobacistat has more P-glycoprotein effects than ritonavir. Um, ritonavir has a little bit more specific effects on 2D6. Um, Cobacistat's the only pharmacokinetic enhancer when we talk about integrase inhibitors at Stribil that's approved. Um, and Cobacistat's the only one that's um, co-formulated with our modern protease inhibitors, so darunavir and adazanavir. Um, the rule of thumb with ritonavir, since you're giving it separate from its um, protease inhibitor that you're boosting, is give it at the same time that you're giving your protease inhibitor. So if you're giving adazanavir once a day, you give ritonavir once a day at the same time. If you're giving Prezista once a day, you give Norvir once a day at the same time. If you're giving Prezista twice a day, you give it Norvir twice a day at the same time. Um, initially, Ritonavir was um, dosed as an antiretroviral, but at 600 milligrams BID, which is the dose that it interferes with viral replication, it also causes a ton of GI side effects and patients don't like to stay on it. So if you um, lower that dose, you get your good pharmacokinetic effects. Okay, so back to drug interactions. I jumped ahead of myself. So this is not a complete list by any means, but these are um, some of the drug interactions that I feel like um, I see the most often in a primary care setting. So um, these are all drugs that are going through the um, CYP enzymes and being um, being boosted along with the protease inhibitor if you're using cobacistat or norvir. So statins, lovastatin and simvastatin are contraindicated. Um, their area under the curve boosted there is just ridiculously high. Um, you can do atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, but you do need to max out your lower doses. Um, so the guideline recommendation, uh, depending on which protease inhibitor you're using, um, these are for darunavir, which is again what most people are using. Um, recommend maxing out at 20 of atorvastatin or rosuvastatin 10. Um, rifampin across the board, rifampin is a pharmacist's nightmare. Um, it will interact with your pharmacokinetic enhancers, so keep that in mind. Um, anticonvulsants, again, carbamazepine, phenobarb, phenytoin, we all know that those have a lot of drug interactions. Um, they also interact, so um, you wanna be very careful. Um, I, they aren't quite contraindicated, but you do have to be very careful with monitoring. Um, the novel anticoagulants, so um, Eloquis, Seralto, um, those, the exception is Eloquis, the others are contraindicated uh, because you'll see, we don't have a good way to monitor these drugs right now, and so you'll end up with an increased bleeding risk. The um, exception to that is Eloquis. Um, you can dose Eloquis at 50% of its dose when given with a pharmacokinetic enhancer. My caution there is that those, as far as I'm aware of everything I've looked at, those are completely off of pharmacokinetic studies. Those are not off of patient data studies. Um, that being said, we've done this a couple of times. We've had patients on darunavir, cobacistat, 
with Eliquis 2.5 and the patients have done well. Um, if I can, I try to get them off the protease inhibitor, but we have a couple of patients that they just can't come off their protease inhibitor due to resistance or other problems. And so um, in that case, if they need anticoagulation, we've gone with Eliquis. You can still do warfarin. You'll get a drug interaction um, on your EMR that warfarin interacts, but remember we can monitor INRs with warfarin and so it's a lot easier um, and safer to know where we're at there. Um, but you probably will need a lower dose of Coumadin um, if you're giving it with a pharmacokinetic enhancer. Um, steroids also get increased. Um, so increased risk of Cushing syndrome. Of course, we all know that nobody should be on PO steroids long term. Um, but the one place you have to think about this is, you know, inhaled or intranasal steroids. Um, we've actually, Dr. Ladd and I have actually seen it with ocular steroids. It was the weirdest thing. Um, I wouldn't have expected it with ocular steroids, but sure enough, the guy shows up like with all of these steroid side effects. Um, so you do have to be careful with those. Um, they're not contraindicated, but again, make sure you're monitoring the patient. Um, I, bursts of steroids, you know, if somebody has a COPD exacerbation or um, they run into some poison ivy in the summer or whatever, if you're just needing to give a burst of steroids, that's usually fine. Know that it's going to be increased if they're on a protease inhibitor, but a short-term burst of steroids is not a problem. Where I really worry about steroids is those long-term, especially the inhaled steroids, uh, because those are just, we have so many patients on them, and a lot of times we don't even think about it, but you can see increased absorption of, of those steroids. Um, cardiac meds, probably the biggest one here um, that I see is your calcium channel blocker, specifically Norvasc. Um, 10 milligrams is a max dose for most people, but if they're on a protease inhibitor, um, really probably should max out at five. You can also see interactions with amiodarone and digoxin, but I'm not seeing as much digoxin used these days or even amiodarone, so know that they're there, um, but um, probably um, Norvasc is the one that I'm seeing the most commonly. Um, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors um, are only contraindicated, contraindicated when they're the daily dose for pulmonary hypertension. Then it's contraindicated because you'll get too much of a boosted effect. However, um, if you're needing to give it for um, erectile dysfunction, um, you can do so. I recommend starting at the lower doses because, again, those drugs will be boosted. So you may not need Viagra 50. You may be able to get away with Viagra 25. Um, so just things to think about. Uh, so specifically into the specifics of darunavir and adizanavir, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with some drug interaction specifics as well. So darunavir, um, so this is one of our preferred protease inhibitors. It can be given once or twice daily. So if it's given twice daily, it's 600 milligrams twice a day, and if it's um, given once daily, it's 800 daily. Um, it is uh, available as a single tablet regimen, which is Simtuza, so that's darunavir with cobacystat, taf, and emtricitabine. Um, it's a fairly large pill, but honestly, it's no bigger than um, Prescovix, which I find interesting um, that they were able to fit two more drugs in there and get it to the same size as Prescovix. Um, do keep in mind certain insurances do not like to pay for Simtusa. They want you to go Prescovix to Scovy combination, um, but it is available as a single tablet regimen if you can get insurance to pay for it. Um, again, it requires that pharmacokinetic enhancer. It's Prescovix if it's combined with the um, Cobacistat. Um, GI adverse effects are probably the one that I see most commonly, um, and then some metabolic effects, but I feel like darunavir is much cleaner than its other um, older uh, comparison drugs. The rash, um, I bring this up because if you have a patient who's sulfa allergic, you're probably going to get a flag that they shouldn't use darunavir. That being said, we use a ton of darunavir in our clinic, and I've only seen a sulfa rash off of one patient for sure, two pa patients maybe. Um, so darunavir does have a sulfa moiety in it, but the way it's set into the chemical structure of the molecule um, doesn't seem to react. And in all the studies of darunavir, patients that had sulfa allergies reacted um, with the same rate of rash as somebody who didn't have a sulfa allergy. So I consider it safe. Um, we give darunavir regardless of a sulfa allergy. And again, I've only seen a sulfa rash off of darunavir um, for sure in one patient, and I suspect it in the second patient. So. Um, Pretty, pretty rare that we're seeing that. Adizanavir is your other protease inhibitor. Again, in the guidelines, um, it has a, lot higher, a lower level of recommendation than darunavir. Um, Adizanavir, you can actually do optional pharmacokinetic enhancing. It is recommended 
um, but you can give it without the pharmacokinetic enhancer. So if you have some reason that you need to avoid norvirocopacistat, um, you can give Rayataz or Atazanafil without it. You do have to dose it higher, so it'd be Atazan or 400 um, once daily. Um, if you're giving us a pharmacokinetic enhancer, it's Atazan or 300 with its pharmacokinetic enhancer. It is co-formulated with copacistat, it's Evotaz. It does not have a single tablet regimen. Um, adverse effects are very similar to Darunavir with GI being the most common I see. Um, you can see hyperbilirubinemia. Um, and when I see this, it's typically just a lab finding um, and you don't have to worry about it unless the patient's symptomatic. Now, obviously if the patient becomes symptomatic, stop the drug, move to something else. But as long as they're just having asymptomatic hyperbilirubinemia, um, you say, good job, you're taking your meds. Um, Nephrolithiasis, this one is like the pharmacy nerd in me thinks this is the coolest thing ever as far as adverse effects. I'm sure patients that have this think it's way less cool than I do. Um, but the nephrolithiasis is they end up with a kidney stone that if you analyze the kidney stone, it's actually atazanavir. Um, so it's actually the drug concentrating there in their kidneys. And so um, if that does occur, I've only seen it twice. Um, if that does occur, stop the atazanavir, move them to something else. So. Uh, but just know if you have a patient on Atazanavir and they end up with reoccurring kidney stones, get the stone analyzed because it could be that it's actually the drug causing their problems, not, um, not something else. Okay, so specifics on guidelines. So I talked a lot about drug interactions and so the common ones that I see on a regular, you know, day-to-day -day basis in the clinic. Um, but here's some places where you can go um, to look at drug interactions, especially if, you know, your EMR is popping a drug interaction, you're like, oh no, what do I do? Um, the first place I always go are the DHHS guidelines. They're, you know, they're right there. They're easily accessible. Table 17 through 20 um, give you just some great drug interactions. You can even go in in through um, drug interactions, protease inhibitor, and scroll down to find it. Um, you know, if you're on the PDF, you can do um, Alt F and search um, what you're wanting to do and hit find. Um, so the guidelines are really the first place that I go um, because the beauty of the guidelines is not only do they tell you um, what the drug interaction is, they'll actually give a dosing recommendation. And so on an everyday basis, I have LexiComp um, as a resource on my phone. I use it on our, the computer at work a lot. Um, LexiComp will tell you a drug interaction exists, but it doesn't always tell you what the best route, the next best step is. Um, it'll tell you if it's contraindicated, but then it'll tell you like, hey, there's a drug interaction. Here's the area into the curve. But sometimes that doesn't always tell you like, okay, well, do I do I lower the dose? Do I what do I do about this? Um, where the guidelines, the DHHS guidelines, actually say, hey, this is what you need to do about that, um, which I find super helpful. Um, another place, Toronto um, General Hospital Immunodeficiency Clinic has some resources. Um, these, I found this um, interaction checker more helpful on the inpatient side um, because they have some more specific information on um, ICU drugs, so your drips, and then uh, they have some good um, chemo resources too if you have an oncology HIV patient. Um, that, that you're dealing with. So um, Toronto General Hospital is where I go if I'm needing those specific ones. So not a, not a frequent one that I'm using, but um, it is helpful if you do have that patient. And then my final one, um, this is available on the computer or you can get it as a, um, an app on your phone. Um, University of Liverpool puts out this great drug interaction check. It's very similar to the DHHS guidelines and that you can put in your drugs. Um, it'll give you a green go, yellow, hey, there's, you know, maybe you should look at that, and then a red is contraindication. And then if you were to actually click on that orange box there, it would pop up and kind of give you some recommendations of what to do. And so um, I really like the University of Liverpool. If you're doing hep C treatment, I know this is not a hep C lecture, but if you're doing hep C treatment, they also have a hepatitis C one that's really good as well to look at the drug interactions with hepatitis C. Okay, so that's pretty much... Um, Protease inhibitors. So just remember, lots of lots of drug interactions. So just be cautious of those. Um, drug uh, common side effects are usually GI and metabolic. Just make sure they're taking them with food. It'll help their absorption um, and hopefully decrease some of those GI effects. Um, you have multiple options for drug interaction databases. So um, just know where your resources are at. Um, I it's. It's an uncommon day when I'm not looking up a drug interaction in this clinic. So um, just become familiar with them um, and you should do well. Any questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Con.